Hello and welcome to the Mercury Project. Mercury Redstone 3, or Freedom 7, was the first United States human spacecraft. On May 5th, 1961, piloted by Alan Shepard, it was the first planned flight of Project Mercury, the objective of which was to put an astronaut into orbit around the Earth and return him safely. Shepard's mission was a 15-minute suborbital flight with the primary objective of demonstrating his ability to withstand the high g-forces of launch and atmospheric re-entry. Shepard named his spacecraft Freedom 7, setting a precedent for the remaining six Mercury astronauts naming their spacecraft. The Mercury 7 was included in all manned Mercury spacecraft names in honor to NASA's first group of seven astronauts. His spacecraft reached an altitude of 116.5 statute miles and traveled a downrange distance of 302.8 statute miles. It was the fourth Mercury flight launched with the Mercury Redstone launch vehicle from Cape Canaveral, Florida, close to the Atlantic Ocean. During the flight, Shepard observed the Earth and tested the capsule's altitude control system turning the capsule around to face its blunt heat shield forward for atmospheric re-entry. He also tested the retro rockets, which would return later missions from orbit, though the capsule did not have enough energy to remain in orbit. After re-entry, the capsule landed by parachute on the Atlantic Ocean off the Bahamas. Shepard and the capsule were picked up by helicopter and brought to the aircraft carrier, the USS Lake Champion. The mission was a total success. Though American pride in the accomplishment was dampered by the fact that just three weeks before the Soviet Union had launched their first man in space, Yuri Gargan, who completed one orbit on Vostok 1. In 2017, the first, in 2017, the first National Astronaut Day was held on May 5th to pay tribute to his first flight. Preparation The Freedom 7 spacecraft, Mercury Capsule No. 7, was delivered to Cape Canaveral on December 9, 1960. It had been originally expected that a mission could be launched soon after the spacecraft was available, but capsule number seven turned out to require extensive development and testing work before it was determined safe for flight. However, as it had been embarked since the summer as the first manned spacecraft, the decision was taken to delay the mission until a particular capsule was ready with the tentative launch date of March 6, rather than use the alternate capsule. The booster originally intended for flight, Redstone No. 3, had been delivered to the Cape in early December. However, it was then used on the MR-1A test flight on December 19th. The replacement, Redstone No. 7, did not arrive at the Cape until late March. By this time, however, the mission had already been postponed to await the results of another test flight. In late 1960, there had been a growing number of concerns about the standards of the Redstone launch vehicle. The MR-2 test flight, manned by a chimpanzee, had technical problems during the launch, leading to the spacecraft flying too high, too far, and too fast. As a result, the mission was two minutes longer than planned, and the re-entry subjected the passenger to 14.7 Gs rather than the planned fixture of approximately 12 Gs. The splashdown point was 60 miles from the nearest recovery ship, and it was over two and a half hours before a helicopter could recover the capsule and its passenger, by which time it almost sunk. As a result, NASA was unwilling to launch the MR-3 mission without further development work. By late February, there were still seven major altercations they had made to the booster, which required testing. An additional testing flight was accordingly added to the schedule, MRBD, for booster development. It was originally known as MRA2. This would launch on March 28th, pushing the MR3 back a month to April 25th. The MRB2 flight was almost completely successful, ensuring that a manned MR3 flight could proceed without further significant delay. The pilot for the MR-3 had been chosen several months in advance, in early January, by the head of the program, Robert R. Gulruth. He had selected Alan Shepard as a primary pilot, with John Glenn and Gus Grissom as his backups. The other members of the Mercury 7 continued to train for later missions. 
Three names were announced to the press on February 22nd without any indication as to which of these three expected to fly the mission. Shepard's name was announced publicly after the initial launch attempt had been canceled, as Gilruth wished to keep his options open in the event last-minute personnel changes were required. Glenn served as Shepard's backup on launch day, with Grissom focusing on training for the MR4, the next suborbital mission. The initial launch attempt on May 2nd was canceled due to weather problems, two hours and 20 minutes before the lunchtime, with Shepard waiting in a hangar already suited and prepared. The flight was rescheduled for two days later, when it was delayed one more time due to inclement weather conditions, until May 5th with an expected launch time of 7.20 a.m. The flight. The countdown began at 8.30 p.m. the previous night with Shepard waking up and eating breakfast of steak and eggs with toast, coffee, and orange juice. The steak and eggs breakfast would soon become a tradition for astronauts the morning of a launch. He entered the spacecraft at 5.15 a.m., just two hours before the planned 7.20 launch time. At 7.05 a.m., the launch was held for an hour to let the cloud cover clear. Good visibility would be essential for photographs of the Earth, and fix a power supply unit shortly after the countdown started. Another hold was called in order to reboot a computer at the Goddard Space Flight Center. The count was eventually resumed after slightly over two and a half hours of unplanned holds, and continued with no further faults. All of the delays resulted in Shepard lying on his back in the capsule for almost three hours. Mercury Redstone 3 finally lifted off at 9.34 a.m., watched by an estimated 45 million television viewers in the United States. Shepard was subject to a maximum acceleration of 6.3 Gs just before the Redstone engine shut down. Two minutes and 22 seconds after launch, Freedom 7's space-fixed velocity was 5,134 miles per hour, close to the planned value. Ten seconds later, the escape tower was jettisoned. At the three-minute mark, the automated altitude control system rotated Freedom 7 so that the heat shield faced forward, ready for re-entry. Shepard was now able to take manual control of the spacecraft and begin testing whether he was able to adjust its orientation. The first thing he did was position the spacecraft to its retrofire altitude of 34 degree pitch. Then he tested the manual control of the yaw, motion from left to right, and roll. When he took control of all three axes, he found that the spacecraft response was about the same as that of the Mercury simulator. However, he could not hear the jets firing as he could on the ground due to the levels of background noise. The second objective was to make observations of the ground from the spacecraft. Returning the spacecraft to automatic control, Shepard found that he was able to distinguish major land masses from clouds easily, and could make out coastlines, islands, and major lakes, but had difficulties identifying cities. He had problems working with the spacecraft periscope, Early Mercury capsules had a small periscope rather than a viewing window, and had to abandon an attempt to change optical filters on it after noticing that a pressure gauge on his wrist kept bumping the lever that would have activated the launch escape system. Although the escape tower was long gone, and pressing on the lever probably wouldn't do anything, Shepard still didn't want to take the risk in case of something unexpected happened. Under automatic control, the spacecraft had developed a slight movement as it passed through peak altitude. Shepard now switched into the fly-by-wire mode. The pilot used a controller to order the automatic system to fire the rockets for the designated positioning, rather than manually controlling the individual rockets. Adjusting roll and yaw, he found the pitch position was around 10 degrees too shallow. 25 degrees rather than the desired 35 for re-entry. As he began to correct it, the timed retro rockets fired to send him into re-entry. The retro rocket pack strapped atop the heat shield and so requiring release before re-entry was successfully jettisoned, but the confirmation light failed, requiring Shepard to activate the manual override for the jettison system before it confirmed that the rockets were fully jettisoned. Shepard resumed fly-by-wire control after retrofire, 
reporting that it felt smooth and gave the sensation of being fully in command of the craft. Before letting the automatic systems briefly take over to reorient the craft for re-entry, he kept the controls until the G-force peaked at 11.6 Gs. During re-entry, he held the capsule until it had stabilized and then relinquished control of the automatic system. The descent was faster than anticipated, but the parachutes deployed as planned. A drogue at 21,000 feet and a main parachute at 10,000 feet. Splashdown occurred with an impact comparable to a landing on a jet aircraft carrier. Freedom 7 was tilted to its right side about 60 degrees from the upright position, but it did not show any signs of leaking. It gently righted itself after a minute and Shepard was able to report to the circling aircraft that he had landed safely and was ready to be recovered. A recovery helicopter arrived after a few minutes, and after a brief problem with the spacecraft antenna, the capsule was lifted partly out of the water in order to allow Shepard to leave by the main hatch. He squeezed out the door into a sling hoist and was pulled into the helicopter, which flew both the astronaut and a spacecraft to the waiting aircraft carrier, the USS Lake Champion. The whole recovery process had taken only 11 minutes from splashdown to arriving aboard. The flight lasted 15 minutes, 22 seconds, and the spacecraft traveled 302 miles from its launch point, ascending to 116.5 miles. Following the flight, the spacecraft was examined by engineers and found to be in excellent shape, so much so that they decided it could have been safely used again in another launch. Given to the Smithsonian Institution by NASA, Freedom 7 was previously displayed at the U.S. Naval Academy in Maryland until 2012. Since 2012, it has been on display at the John F. Kennedy Library in Boston, Massachusetts. Thank you for watching the Mercury Project, Mercury Redstone 3. Next week we'll be doing Redstone 4. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe if you can, if you already have. Thank you, and have a great day. Bye-bye.